conversation than a than just me talking at you for a long time. Um, my name is Rachel Ross, and I have my name tag, and of course, I forgot it in my purse. So anyway, my name is Rachel, um, and I've been with the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program at Stanford for almost four years now. Um, and I'm excited to share a little bit more about it, but I'd love to get to know a little bit more about each of the students that we have here in the room. So if you could share your name and maybe the year you are um, here and, and what you're studying, what you might be interested in studying in the future, that would be great. So, um, yeah. Sure. So my name is Eli. I'm a junior. I study political science and I'd be interested in pursuing a PhD. In okay. Awesome. I'm Daniel. I usually go by Danny. I'm a junior studying finance and computer science, and I'm interested in uh, doing a JD. Okay. I'm Gwen. I'm a third year international affairs and Spanish double major, and I'm interested in studying uh, emergency management and disaster response for masters. Hi, I'm Michelle. I am a senior pursuing a dual degree in international affairs with honors in information technology, and I would be interested in pursuing a PhD in geography. Okay, awesome. So we've got Michelle, Gwen, Danny, Eli. Excellent. Okay, well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to share over the course of the next 20 minutes or so a little bit about why my Hennessy Scholars exists at Stanford, who we are as a community, what we do, where we do it on Stanford's campus, how we do it, and then of course how you can apply to join us. But then I do hope we'll have you know a good 30 minutes or so where you can ask any questions. We can just chat about life at Stanford. I myself was a graduate student at one point at Stanford a couple of years ago, so I do know that experience firsthand. So let's dive in. I love that you can see the slide right there. I don't like that. It's great. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Night Scholars brings together a multidisciplinary, multicultural community of graduate students from across Stanford seven graduate schools each year. And we fund our scholars for up to three years of graduate education, full funding for three, up to three years. And we are looking to prepare our scholars for leadership in a variety of sectors, academia, government, nonprofit, corporations, all spaces. Um, the brainchild of this program is John Hennessy, who you see in the far right in the blue tie. John uh, was the president of Stanford University for 16 years, from 2000 to 2016. Before that, he was a, a very longstanding computer science professor um, and provost of, of the university. And he, as he tells it, he looked out into the world in the last year of his presidency, which if we can take ourselves back to 2015, 2016, and felt like there was a lack of leadership in a variety of sectors in our society and, and felt compelled to invest more strongly in how Stanford prepares its graduate students to be leaders, right? Because when we think of leadership, it can often be thought of very traditionally. Um, and PhD students need leadership training. You know, all the disciplines, you know, every field needs leadership training and, and also needs to be exposed to various disciplines and various cultures to solve some of our world's really pressing problems, which is the ultimate mission of this program is that our alums will go off into the world and, and hopefully in whatever space they occupy, do, do some good. Um, John turned to Phil Knight, who's the man in the center of this photo, who's a graduate of Stanford's business school and the co-founder of Nike. And Phil uh, provided a very generous founding donation to this program, hence the name Knight. Hennessy scholars. That's how we get it. So we're very intentional in Negative Hennessy about how we define and cultivate leadership. There are three goals of the Knight Hennessy Scholars Leadership Experience. One is to grow our scholars' multicultural perspective. The second is to deepen our scholars' commitment to a greater good. And the third is to prepare our scholars to drive meaningful results. We hope in our programming that we cultivate opportunities for scholars to practice these behaviors and exercise these traits that you see here. And we hope both during our scholars' time in the program and beyond that our scholars will, will remember these goals, behaviors, and traits um, and ground their, their leadership in this way. Who are we as a scholar community? So I mentioned that John left the Stanford presidency in 2016. So relative to many other scholarships, we're quite young. Um, the first cohort of Knight Hennessy scholars joined Stanford's campus in fall of 2018. So we have admitted five cohorts of Knight Hennessy scholars. We started off with our first cohort at 51 scholars. We've slowly moved up now. We're in the 70 to 80 scholar per year range. We want to build up to 100 scholars per cohort in steady state. That will take us probably another five years or so to, to get there. 
But you can see a little bit about the 300 plus scholars we have thus far in our community. We are, as I mentioned earlier, a multicultural community. So over 40% of our students have a, a non-US passport from over 50 countries. Of our US students, nearly 50% at this point identify as person of color, over 50% of our community is women. From the multidisciplinary standpoint, at Stanford, we have 125 different graduate degree programs, and right now 75 are represented at Knight Hennessy, so we're hoping to eventually get to all 125 one day. You can see the breakdown here across these seven schools at Stanford. So um, our two largest schools at Stanford are engineering and humanities and sciences. Then we have the three professional schools, law, business, medicine. Then you have the two smallest schools, which are education. And then this is inaccurate now because it says earth sciences, but now it's the door school of sustainability. So, um, it, but still one of our smallest schools. So we do not have targets or caps or quotas based on country or based on discipline. Um, but, you know, it's, it sort of often shakes out that we have more scholars in our largest schools and fewer scholars in our smallest schools. All degree types are eligible for Knight Hennessy, PhD students, professional school students, master's students. So we heard a, a, a diversity of interest here in terms of type of degree. And, and we have all those students in our community. And our students are coming from over 120 institutions in the United States and around the world. So institutional diversity is also something that is important to us. About 10% of our scholars also pursue a joint or dual degree. So that is an option. Our community is, of course, more than just our scholars. John Hennessy, our director and founder, and Tina Selig, our executive director, have a combined 70 plus years of experience at Stanford. So they bring with them a really remarkable network of, of connections and resources to our community. We partner with colleagues across Stanford. Dan Klein and Lisa Rowland are two lecturers in our theater department who run an entire first year curriculum focused on storytelling and helping our scholars to build up their storytelling, improv, and presentation skills. We connect our scholars with mentors, um, visiting speakers from the Stanford community and beyond, and scholars also partner very closely with members of the Knight Hennessy team, which I, you know, I sit on the admission side, so I'm definitely engaging with students as they come into the process and into our community, and then we have our program and our operations team that really supports scholars um, when they're, when they're here um, uh, or at Stanford. I want to talk a little bit now about the actual experiences that you might have as a Knight Hennessy Scholar. So I like to say that Knight Hennessy Scholars is both a supplement and a complement to your graduate degree program. So supplement in that it is not a degree granting program, right? You don't just apply to Knight Hennessy Scholars and come and earn a degree from Knight Hennessy Scholars. That's not what happens, right? Every Knight Hennessy Scholar is a full-time degree seeking student at Stanford. They pursue a graduate degree program at Stanford, and that is the core of your Stanford experience. Knight Hennessy Scholars is this wonderful additional supplemental community funding source um, and, and space for leadership development. So there is the opportunity with all this additional programming to really help elevate and enhance your graduate student experience in a way that would be very different than if you just came as a Stanford graduate student. So I wanna share what, that ex what those experiences would look like, but also it is a compliment, right? So in your degree programs at Stanford, you hopefully, like if you're getting a PhD in political science, right? You, you're you having, you know, uh, you're really focusing on one discipline. So there's sort of a depth of disciplinary focus there. And then Knight Hennessy is really broadening um, what you're being exposed to both across disciplines and across cultures. Um, so again, su supplement, and a complement to your graduate student experience. So the, the programming that we offer at Knight Hennessy, we like to group into usually three different sort of categories. And the first is core events, which we don't have many requirements for Knight Hennessy scholars, but there's a small few. Um, and most of these are our core events that we encourage, highly encourage and recommend that every scholar show up to. These include our quarterly town hall, the first week of every quarter, 200 plus scholars get in a room together and two scholars MC our town hall. And it's just 90 minutes together talking about what to expect for the next quarter. Storytelling, I mentioned with Dan and Lisa is part of the first year curriculum for all first year scholars. And then retreats, we have one each quarter in the fall. Our incoming cohort goes just, just alone. So they get to bond as a new cohort um, to a retreat facility in Asilomar, which is in Monterey, California, right by the coast. And then in the winter and spring quarters, we do scholar-wide retreats where about 150 to 200 scholars and team members go to either um, 
it's called a resort, but it sounds fancier than, than it is um, in the Santa Cruz mountains. And then in the spring, we go to Stanford Sierra Camp, which is a kind of literally like a camp that Stanford owns near Lake Tahoe. And um, it's really, really beautiful. And the retreats are meant for community building. So it's a, it's a great time for the scholar community to sort of step away from Stanford for a weekend. Each quarter, we also, Stanford is on the quarter system, um, we have a virtual leadership lecture where we bring a very high profile speaker in to our community to engage in, in conversation with our scholars about leadership and their personal um, leadership experiences. So scholars get to moderate those sessions with these speakers. They also get to introduce the speakers. So there's a lot of really cool skills development opportunities and networking opportunities there. But um, we've had some really amazing Big Mercury Leadership Lectures. Um, we've had Michelle Bachelet, who is the first female president of Chile, was the first female president of Chile. Um, we've had LeBron James come to um, Night Hennessy as a Big Mercury Leadership Lecture. It's helpful when Phil Knight um, is helping to fund, fund your program, who's the founder of Nike. Um, that is helpful. Uh, we had former Secretary of Defense, um, General Jim Mattis come. Um, we have had a Nobel laureate, Dr. Francis Arnold in chemistry. Um, this spring quarter, we have James Zuniga, who, um, who focuses a lot on um, artificial intelligence and ethics. So, you know, there are some really interesting McMurtry leadership lectures that, that have come. We've had Melinda Gates come. We've had Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote a book called Cast, which came out a year or two ago. So anyway, lots of, lots of cool speakers. Last core um, programming that I want to just mention is Keystone Projects. Each fall, we have a Keystone Ideas Festival where usually up to 50 scholars pitch project ideas to the whole scholar community in about 60 to 90 seconds. And then scholars, if they would like to, it's optional, can join a project team. And these are multidisciplinary teams. Um, and they're focused on issues like criminal justice reform, educational inequity, housing law, you know, all these different, you know, lots of different things, whatever, you know, strikes a student's passion. And then scholars can join a team if they want to. And then usually there's about 10 to 20 Keystone Project teams that form. They get funding from Knight Hennessy. Um, they have mentorship opportunities from Knight Hennessy. And then at the end of the year, there's the Keystone Project Showcase where people talk about what they've done. Some people have done it, a project for a couple of years now. So an example of that is our scholar, Brianna, who is doing a master's in the education school, which she already finished, but finishing up now her master's in public policy. And her Keystone Project is, is this organization called Educa Education Justice Academy, where the primary goal is to better um, better train school board, uh, school board, people who are running for school board and school board members. Um, and um, train them sort of with, with the justice um, lens, you know, focusing on educational inequity. So that's one example of a longstanding project that we've had. Some of them are short term, right? Uh, the environmental KH group um, came together and did a Keystone project for a year where they basically got all this information from John Hennessy about how much money we spend, how many flights we go, like sending me places to talk to students and, and basically, you know, made this large proposal to John at the end of the year last year about how we can make KH carbon neutral, um, right? So there's there's lots of different Keystone projects that happen, but it's a cool opportunity for the multicultural, multidisciplinary nature of the program to really come to life. Next, we have electives. Lots of electives each quarter that students can choose from. I'll highlight a few. Curiosity Corner and case studies happen over lunch. So usually it's a group of 30 to 40 scholars in a room. Curiosity Corner, um, brings four to five faculty members into our, our, our home Denning house, which I'll show you in just a moment, to talk to our scholars, give them a prompt for discussion. This quarter is a focus on government and policy. So last week, I was just at Curiosity Corner with Mike McFall, who is a political science professor at the university and the former U.S. ambassador to Russia under President Obama. So he um, spent a lot of time talking about the current, um, you know, recently with the one year anniversary of the, the conflict in Ukraine. So he came and provided some really great perspective on that. So that's curiosity for our case studies is more like leadership in practice, kind of um, learning from leaders. John Hennessy usually leads a case studies. He's done one focused on big issues during his 16 years as Stanford's president, how he dealt with the 2008 recession, you know, things like that. Um, and John and Tina just led one together that was focused on creative problem solving in a variety of organizations. Global Travel Study is the last elective that I will highlight. Every scholar, in addition to receiving three 
full years of funding also is funded for one global travel study trip during their time in the program. Each year we go to about five to seven different places. So this year our scholars went to, um, there were trips offered to um, Berlin, Germany, Costa Rica, Norway, Turkey, South Africa. I went on a trip to Chile with 25 of our scholars to Patagonia, which is really beautiful and amazing and a once in a lifetime opportunity. And then another trip went to Israel and Palestine. So this upcoming year, we're going to Mongolia, South Africa, again, India, Jordan, and Vietnam. So lots of different places to choose from. Every trip has a theme. We go with a Stanford faculty member who's an expert in that theme. And it's a really fun seven to 10 days where there's lots of community building and exposure to a different culture. So um, that's a little bit about electives. Now, lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about scholar-driven events. So much of the culture and community is driven by our scholars themselves. So scholars organize and execute dozens of events um, for Nine Hennessy through our funding. And they range from really social events like winter formals, Halloween party that we have each year to sometimes more serious events like this one here where two of our scholars, Eli and Amanda, who you see here, this was a hybrid event, um, I think in 2021, uh, which was focused on the issue of solitary confinement. Um, so there's a, a whole variety of scholar-driven events, but, but lots of these as well. So that gives you a small sampling of the opportunities that would be available to you um, with Knight Hennessy Scholars. Where do we do all this? Well, this is our, this is our convening hub on Stanford's campus, Denning House. So the building is bigger than this, so this is sort of the front area. It's a really beautiful space that was built exclusively for Knight Hennessy scholars. And uh, this is where our events take place. It's where I work every day, where John Hennessy works every day. And scholars are in and out of here every single day. There's free lunch Monday through Thursday. Um, so there's a lot of hustle and bustle. You know, our lunchtime events, Curiosity Corner, case studies are happening. Scholars will come in the morning to study for a couple hours. So it is a true kind of hub for our community. It's located on Stanford's campus. Has anyone been to Stanford University before? Okay, well, if you ever have a chance to go, even if you're not, you know, even if you're not a graduate student, if you ever make it to the Bay Area, you should just look because it's stunning. And this is really beautiful, um, beautiful, beautiful campus, very different than the, the New England uh, campuses that I was accustomed to growing up and just a beautiful place to spend a couple of years in graduate school. We have just over 9,000 graduate students um at Stanford and a little over 7,000 undergrads so much smaller much smaller than here um but but still you know a good good size school um 95 percent of our students live on campus uh housing is guaranteed for all first year graduate students and Knight Hennessy scholars get priority housing um in the lottery that first year most students live on campus because the Bay Area is very expensive so we try very hard at Stanford to make sure that people have housing we are located in the broader Bay Area, which again, you know, just even outside of Stanford, it's just this extraordinarily beautiful um, place to be. Um, everywhere you turn, there's a different type of um, like physical environment, right? You can go hiking and then you can go um, find snow in four hours um, and go skiing. And so it's a, it's, it's a beautiful go to the coastline, right? It's a beautiful place to be. Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit about funding because this is of course a scholarship. So something um, that is appealing about the program, uh, particularly for our, you know, those interested in professional schools, um, which those programs and master's degrees, those programs can be very expensive. Um, we provide up to three years of graduate funding. We cover your entire tuition, all associated fees for your specific program. We provide a quarterly stipend for living expenses. We cover travel home once per year, either domestic or international. We give you your first year a relocation and technology stipend, and we also provide access to a couple of different funds during your time as a scholar. There's academic enrichment funds. We also provide some funding that scholars can use for mental health purposes. Um, so we have tried to fill in some needs that may be missing in the broader university space, but we don't try and replicate what's already being provided by the university. So it is very robust funding. Um, the value proposition of Knight Hennessy Scholars from a financial standpoint looks very different for those who are interested in a master's degree or a professional school degree where this is really financially life-changing versus a PhD student at Stanford who is guaranteed full funding for up to five years. So that's true for all PhD students at Stanford. But what is nice about the Knight Hennessy funding for your first three years is that you know where your funding is coming from if you get this scholarship for three years. You don't have to worry about the dynamics between you and your funding 
provider, which is your department or your professor. Um, and that changes a little bit of the, the relationship there. Um, you have then the time and energy instead of thinking about funding to focus on other aspects of your research or other things that you want to spend your time doing on campus. Some of our students don't have to TA as much because they don't need some of that extra um, as a funding source. So there are certain advantages financially still for PhD students. But I will say from PhD students, we actually get the most feedback about how the community itself has been really experience altering for them at Stanford because PhD students are really in small programs. So, you know, we have PhD programs that are maybe three, five, 10, 15 people, and the community really allows them to see much more of Stanford. And generally, even across the professional schools who have robust communities, um, the community is really what scholars say has been the biggest thing for them socially, but also from an experience standpoint widening what they're being exposed to that so many of our scholars have changed their directions um not for not not professionally but just sort of it has altered their thinking about the world because of that exposure to the various disciplines and cultures that we have in the community we are certainly probably the most diverse community on Stanford's campus um and so it's you know there's a lot of amazing um things that come from that Okay, so now I, I want to close by talking a little bit about how you could apply to join us if this is something that might be of interest to you in the future. I know there was a couple of juniors, I think, here. So this isn't something that you could apply for until, you know, your senior year. But even then, you have a large window with which you can apply to Knight Hennessy Scholars. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. In terms of eligibility, we are open to residents of all countries around the world. So we don't have caps or targets or quotas based on country or discipline. In order to be eligible for Knight Hennessy, you have to submit two separate applications to Stanford University. One is directly to Knight Hennessy scholars. The other is to your department. So you have two different deadlines, two applications that are different with two different criteria and potentially two different sets of requirements. So it's important if you're really serious about pursuing this scholarship that you give yourself the time, the gift of time to focus on these applications, to take advantage of the resources that are offered at your university, um, you know, people who want to help you in these processes. So time, time is very important. But you must apply and eventually be admitted to your Stanford degree program. And I'll talk about how those timelines work in just a moment. There is a mistake. This is for last year. Basically, if you're interested in applying this year, right, this should say 2017 or later. But just know that the window post when you earn your first undergrad degree. So if you're gonna earn your undergraduate degree in 2024, right? You basically have until 2031, which sounds so bizarre to say that, that is a year that will come eventually, <laughs> um, 2031, um, to apply to Knight Hennessy. So you have quite a bit of time, right? And you always apply to Knight Hennessy the fall before you intend to start graduate school. You can't defer a Knight Hennessy offer. So you want to apply to Knight Hennessy. You could apply to your department, and, and some departments defer, like I know the business school does that a lot. You could apply to, you know, this year for the business school for deferred admissions, but then you'd only apply to Knight Hennessy the fall before you intend to start your graduate education. Um, there is not a limit to the number of times you could apply. You could apply and think you might want to go to grad school, then decide at the last minute, like, oh, I maybe you didn't get into the program of your choice, or you decide graduate school is not for you. Like, you can apply to Knight Hennessy two years later, and your application might look really different. So that's something to keep in mind. In terms of criteria for Knight Hennessy, what we're looking for when we select our scholars, we're looking for independence of thought, purposeful leadership, and civic mindset. Independence of thought is really about your academic ability and your academic attitude, right? We're looking for visionary thinkers, people who are curious and open-minded and analytical, who are interested in cross-cultural perspectives and eager to kind of tackle um, some of the world's really um, sort of as John likes to say, wicked problems, right? Pressing problems in the world. Purposeful leadership is speaking to how you lead in the places that you have spent your time and the type of results and impact you're having in those spaces. So we're looking for courageous leaders, those who are um, ethical, who are decisive, who are resilient, who are able to include and inspire others in their work and those who are able to, again, have some, some meaningful results and impact. Civic mindset is about really the type of community member that you are, how you interact with others, how you think about others, right? So there's there's lots of layers across all of these criteria, which I hope is helpful because in any space you are in, you can show evidence of these three criteria. 
Um, so civic mindset is about, you know, are you humble and kind? Are you oriented to act in service of others? Do you think about the greater good? And that looks really different for people. And that's okay, right? Like uh, somebody who's interested in a PhD, you know, maybe they spent a lot of time in undergrad, you know, preparing themselves to do research, but like, how are they thinking about their work? Are they thinking about the implications of that research more broadly, right? You can show, again, independence of thought and civic mindset in, in that, but that might be very different than somebody who say is leading a volunteer organization in a community that's also civic mindset. It's just, they can look really different. And I hope students realize that because some people look at the criteria and think, you know, I don't have all three of these and uh, that's okay. Also, we have what I call spiky scholars, which are people who really are very strong in one of them. Um, and we like those people too. So there's many different paths to becoming an Ihennessy scholar. So now I wanna just give you a little preview of the timeline. Again, you could be applying four or five years from now. So you'll have to kind of revisit this timeline, but this gives you a sense of how the two processes work together. Because remember, it's two applications, Knight Hennessy scholars, and then your Stanford degree program. So I'll start with Knight Hennessy. Our application will open this year on June 1st of 2023. And the applications are typically due in early to mid-October. We haven't finalized our application date just yet. We will in the next four to six weeks. Um, at this time in October, you have to submit a basic online application, a one-page resume, transcripts from any institution that you've earned a or plan to earn a degree from, test results if your Stanford degree program requires them, short answers and one longer essay, and then two recommendation letters. So that is for Knight Hennessy. Again, your department may have different requirements. Now, when all this is happening at the same time, there's various deadlines for the Stanford degree programs. So the MBA, that deadline for round one is in September. So you'd be applying before the Knight Hennessy deadline. MD is in October, GSC is in November, and usually most others you have to submit by early December to be considered for Knight Hennessy. So you will have two separate deadlines, the KHS one, and then whatever your department deadline is. Um, so please, you know, be mindful of that. What happens between December and May is that at this time in December, we verify that everyone in our pool has applied to Stanford. You'd be surprised at the number of people who apply to Knight Hennessy and do not submit their Stanford grad app on time. They cannot be considered for the scholarship. So um, this is why we do that verification. Then in January, we invite typically up to 500 people, um, 500 of our applicants to submit a two minute or less video statement. Um, the video is not any more important than any other aspect of the application, even though it seems like it is because it's asked for separately. But really, it's just a way of us giving a nod to people who are quite competitive in our process and saying, hey, like we want to hear more from you. Um, but also, um, the video is not the determinant of whether you're selected as a finalist or not. But we didn't want to ask 7,000 people to submit a video when we only really use it for a couple hundred people. Um, so there's the video statement. And then from that group, we select usually up to 170 finalists. All the finalists are invited to campus for something called Immersion Weekend, which is basically an interview weekend, but also, you know, interviews are two hours or less of your time. It's a lot of community building, a lot of just having a great time getting to know really interesting people. Even those who were not selected, they say there was a lot of value in that weekend. It's fully funded to come to Stanford um, for that two and a half days. And then we select scholars in mid-March. We're, we're in that process right now. We will announce uh, next week. Um, and then at the same time this is happening, decisions for the departments are coming out. So we are talking to each other. So at this stage, everyone who's invited to Immersion Weekend is at least competitive for admission to their program. Some already know they've been admitted. Some have not been. About 80 to 85 percent of our finalists get admitted to Stanford. Not everyone, though. And if they're not admitted, we can't select them as a scholar. You can be selected by your degree program and not selected by Knight Hennessy and still come to Stanford and be a, a wonderful part of the Knight Hennessy community. So hopefully that gives you a sense of how, how these are connected, but they are separate processes, but they happen simultaneously. So that about wraps up what I want to share with you. I'll just stress here that Again, the mission of our, of our program is to bring together a multicultural, multidisciplinary community of graduate students who are interested in going off into the world to address some pressing problems and to do it with, with um, access to this, to this really diverse um, community. 
And I think John's hope is that regardless of whether you come to Stanford or Knight Hennessy Scholars, that more people are, are thinking in the world about how to, um, to make the world a better place and, and how to do that through, through effective leadership. So um, I'm happy now to answer any and all questions that you might have. Um, they can be comments, questions, thoughts, anything. Um, and if not, we will, we will wrap before the hour is up. Okay, question. <laughs> Over here. If you were to apply for, let's say, like a PhD and a JD, like joint, mm -hmm. would you get funding for five years or three years? So it's always three years. It's a great question. We always get a lot of funding questions. And every funding situation is unique because everyone has, has a different, you know, combination of, of programs, but um, it is only three years. So what typically happens with our JD PhDs is we say, you might want to front load your JD as much as possible because that is the more expensive degree. And that is the one where you're not guaranteed funding. So um, we do work with every scholar. We have a scholar funding manager, Perla Miranda, who's on our Knight Hennessy team, who works with scholars to support them specifically through the funding because um, it's complicated for everyone. Obviously, first day of law school student, it's super easy, right? You're, you come for three years, you get all of your JD funded, and that's pretty much it. But more complicated for a JD PhD, we have MD PhDs, we have MBAs and master's candidates, like we've got lots of different funding situations, but you're not guaranteed funding beyond three years. So it is something to keep in mind, say, for somebody who might be interested in a program like the JD MBA, those are two, two professional school programs where none of, funding is not guaranteed. So you would get three years covered by Knight Hennessy, and then the fourth year, you would probably have to apply for need-based funding, and you might not get any. So it is important to understand the full funding picture um, but in a situation like a PhD, JD, most of the JD would be covered. And then the PhD, you have to work with your department directly to figure out how those last few years would get funded. But every PhD at Stanford, again, is guaranteed, um, up to five years of, of funding. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. First one, how walkable, bikeable is Stanford's? Very, very, uh, there, Stanford is full of bikes. Um, which is interesting as a driver on campus, but lots of bikes, every, almost, I would say it's an, a very high percentage of people have bikes. So you feel like you are surrounded by bikes. Um, and very walkable, right? Stanford is a big campus, but it is, I didn't have a bike when I was a grad student and I chose to walk everywhere and I still found it to be really reasonable. Um, so yes, very, very walkable, very bikeable. It, it is, it is, um, very much is a large campus and it's very much a campus, right? It is, um, you know, there, there are not that many roads driving through um, Stanford's campus, which is great. We can answer both questions at once. Okay, great. Any other questions? So it sounds like the Knight Hennessy and the grad school like review processes are like completely yeah. separate. And so there's no like, like if there's like a scholar that you really want, but they just don't make the cut, then it's just. Yes. We wish you well. Yes. I mean, it's really, um, it's, in, this is one thing that makes Knight Hennessy unique among the fellowships is, you know, it's not like we can make, we can, we, we can't admit people to Stanford. And maybe one day we will, but right, like we're just not at that place in time. So, um, and what's interesting about Knight Hennessy different than other fellowships is it's not like people are, you know, it's not like, oh, I want this cool opportunity. I'm going to go to China for a year to do Schwarzman, or I really want a Rhodes Scholarship. So I'm going to go to Oxford and pursue this degree that I might not have pursued otherwise. Knight Hennessy is very much like, I'm going to graduate school. And there's this really cool program that I might want to pursue that provides funding, right? So the first step for a Knight Hennessy person is when do you want to go to grad school? What program are you interested in? Like those are the first questions because most people who are successful in our process can very clearly articulate the why behind why they're taking these next steps. So it's really about coming, you're coming to grad school and then it's like this really interesting, unique opportunity to elevate and enhance your graduate student experience. So, you know, we, we, we are not, it wouldn't work for us to admit students who are interested in say pursuing a PhD in biophysics and then be like, oh, well, we selected you and, you know, your program didn't admit you. And we don't, even if we did have a relationship with another department, we were like, yes, everyone could be admitted here. It's like somebody who wants to go get a PhD in biophysics is not going to, you know, just pursue a random 
masters or something. So yeah. um, yes, it is an unfortunate piece of our process. It happens every year. We have students who we are very interested in that the department is not interested in. And there are some, there's a few departments where we do have some influence, um, but not PhDs. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, they have very specific requirements. They're looking at applications with a very specific lens. Um, and that's where we have the most trouble in 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 aligning. Um, but you know, and so we we would love to have more PhD applicants and and more PhDs in our program. Um, as you can imagine, the professional schools, because of the financial you know piece of this, we we always have a lot of applications to the professional schools. Um, and there's that's a little bit easier. We always match up with people with that the department also likes, but a little bit harder on the, the PhD front. Did you? mentioned in passing that if you're accepted into a PhD program at Stanford, that there is funding regardless of night Hennessy for those students? Yes. And so, okay. Yes, there is funding, and that's you would work with your department directly. We now, for the first time this past year, uh, increased our eligibility to include first-year PhD students at Stanford. So um, that means that when you come to Stanford in, in the fall, right, you could apply for night Hennessy to fund your second, third, and fourth years and apply for that October deadline the first year at Stanford. So we did this year have okay. PhD students who reapplied. Um, and we we always have reapplicants, but this was the first time we ever had first year PhD students who had the chance to apply. And then for people who might not have heard of us, they come to Stanford and they can now apply as a PhD student because PhDs are on campus for so long compared to some of our other students. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, well, thank you very much for coming and listening. And, you know, I know for many of you, you again, graduate school may be a couple of years down the road. You may not have a decision yet, but it's nice to at least have some information in your back pocket for when um, for when you might want to apply to grad school and potentially apply to So thank you for having thank me. Thank you so much for, for joining us today.